Well, good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Good See you folks out on this beautiful day. Let's go ahead and seek the Lord's favor and grant the understanding and applying His word today. Our Father and our God, thank you for sovereignly drawing us here this morning to worship you, the one true God, together as a family. <laughs> Lord, you know the, the true state of each soul that is here. So I commit them uh, to your care and according to your wisdom and knowledge. For those who need to be comforted and encouraged, I pray that you would do that work. For those who need to be convicted and repent, do that work for me. I can do nothing but preach the words that you have laid on my heart, and I know that in and of themselves they're just that, they're just words. Your words have power. You are powerful beyond measure. Your spirit is powerful. And so I pray that he would do that work uh, that only he can do, applying your word to the hearts of the people here this morning, bringing about whatever result you would have that brings you maximum glory. Help us to receive your word by faith, to cling to it, bear much fruit from it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here's a little test for you. So finish the following statement. No pain. No gain. No gain. Hey, got it. Good job. No pain, no gain became quite popular in the early 80s as a phrase used to describe an effective workout. No pain, no gain. You won't get the results you're looking for if it doesn't hurt at least a little. That was the idea. The saying was propelled to popularity in part by Jane Fonda and her aerobic workout videos. Now, I have distinct memories of being a little kid while my mom listened to Jane Fonda tell us to feel the burn. And of course, no pain, no gain. And that was on VHS nonetheless. I got my little sweatband out and I was there doing the, the moves with my mom. Now medical professionals are in disagreement with the statement as it relates to exercise. More specifically, it depends on what sort of pain you're talking about. If you're talking about the pain or the soreness that comes from tearing microscopic muscle fibers, well then yeah, Pain is a good thing, and it will eventually lead to gain. But you know, if you're talking about joint pain or much, much more seriously chest pain, well, that sort of pain probably won't lead to the type of gains you're looking for. There's pain that's beneficial, and there's pain that's detrimental, and it's very important to know the difference. But believe it or not, the idea behind this 80s slogan actually began much, much earlier. You go all the way back to the 7th century BC, and a Greek poet was the first to express the general idea in his larger work called Works and Days. It repeated itself in the 5th century BC, when a Greek playwright named Sophocles stated it more specifically in his play Elector. The line from his play could be translated, nothing truly succeeds without pain, or there is no success without hard work. Historians have found that a 2nd century AD Hebrew work says plainly, According to the pain is the reward. 1577 British poet Nicholas Benton wrote, They must take pain that look for any gain. Even the much-loved Benjamin Franklin got in on the action in 1734 when his alter ego, Poor Richard, said, There are no gains without pains. And so we see that even when it comes to catchy slogans, there's nothing new under the sun. It would seem that Jane Fonda didn't bring anything new to the conversation. And as much as fitness experts may debate the truth of the saying in relationship to exercise, we certainly understand the concept, and we would probably agree with the assessment when it comes to life in general. We understand that some of the greatest successes were birthed from extreme hardships. And anything worth having is also worth sacrificing for. And as much as we might not like to admit it, we have to. Each and every one of us that has a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior must admit that we have done far more growing while walking through the valley and not the mountaintop. We have ultimately benefited far more from times of trial and suffering than we ever have from times of relative ease. We can look back and we understand that, we get that, and, and we even thank God for it on the other side. But what's the problem? Well, if we're honest, deep down, we want the gain without the pain. We want 
to skip the trial and the suffering and get right to the growth. But it just doesn't work that way. The Christian life is a call to suffering on this side of glory. And you heard it last week pretty clearly. Not suffering for sin, not suffering for stupidity, but suffering for Christ and his kingdom. I've always found it fascinating that as Paul and Barnabas are checking in with the churches they planted, as they're encouraging them, this happens. This is from Acts chapter 14, 21 and 22. When they preached the gospel of that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations, through many persecutions, through many afflictions, through, must, through much suffering, we must enter the kingdom of God. That was their encouragement. That's remarkable, is it not? And so the question is, how will you handle those tribulations? Those afflictions, that suffering. Suffering is inevitable. Make no mistake. But also, understand there is a right and a wrong way to suffer. Just like the pain of, of a good workout, there is a detrimental response to suffering, and there's a beneficial response to suffering. And so we want to be successful sufferers. Or as you heard it last week, we want to be sure we don't waste our suffering. Our text today points the way toward that end. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 11. We saw 3 through 7 last week, but for the overall context, let's read them together, beginning in verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may be able to comfort those experiencing any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow toward us, so also our comfort through Christ overflows to you. And if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort that you experience in your patient endurance of the same sufferings that we also suffer. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you will share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction that happened to us in the province of Asia. That we were burdened excessively, beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of living. Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had been passed against us, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He delivered us from so great a risk of death, and He will deliver us. We have set our hope on Him that He will deliver us yet again, as you also join in helping us by prayer, so that many people may give thanks to God on our behalf for the gracious gift given to us through the help of many. Again, that's 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11. And so last week, as we, as we even just read at the beginning, we heard Paul erupt in the statement of praise toward God. Right? He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He's the source of all comfort. He dispels grief by imparting strength to his children who are in the midst of affliction. It's not a comfort as the world offers or defines it. It's divine comfort that can be found nowhere else but God himself. And he gives it in abundant measure. And those who have known that comfort will then, well, they share it with others who are also experiencing afflictions and suffering of their own. And so we saw that suffering deepens our understanding and experience of God's comfort and is ultimately for our own good and for the good of others within the covenant community. That's a point that will continue to be developed today. But in today's text, Paul will give an example of some of the afflictions that he was just describing in verses 3 through 7, and how it actually served to grow him, and how it gives opportunities for the Corinthian church to be blessed by it as well. And as I stated, along the way, he sort of gives us a roadmap to successful suffering. The first thing that we need to acknowledge is the presence of suffering. The presence of suffering. Remember what it was like to be afraid as a child at night? Now for some of you that's a much deeper dive into the memory bank than others. But think about it for a minute. Do you, do you remember what it was like? Specifically, do you remember lying in bed in the dark and, and hearing a strange noise? 
a bump in the night, so to speak, or maybe you, you looked at the wall and you saw an unfamiliar shadow creeping across it. What did you do? I'm sure some of you went tearing right into mom and dad's room, just hollering at the top of your lungs about the monster in your room. Maybe some of you were more like me. I would roll myself into the tightest blanket cocoon I possibly could and then pull the covers up, kind of like this little guy, right? And just wait. I, I said, if I don't look, if I don't move, if I don't even breathe more than I have to, it'll go away on its own. Soon it'll be morning and everything will be as it is supposed to be. If I can just ignore it long enough, it'll be fine. It's sort of interesting how as we grow older, we retain so many of those childhood attitudes about life. It's amazing how many people treat their trials and suffering in this same way. If I just deny it, if I sort of suppress it and push it away, I don't have to acknowledge it, I don't have to deal with it, and it will eventually go away. Just like those shadows that were chased away by the morning sun, so my afflictions will eventually take care of themselves. Except we all know that's not the way that it works. As you heard it last week, Jesus never sugarcoated what the life of a faithful follower would look like. It's not a call to glamorous living. It's not a call to fame and fortune. Rather, it's a call to self-denial and cross-bearing. It's called a persecution and suffering for righteousness' sake. For Christ's sake. But let's be honest. That doesn't preach so well. That's not what people want to hear, is it? People want to hear that Jesus is the answer to all your problems. He is here to make sure that your life is one of bliss and ease and comfort. People are still people and not much has changed. Even back when Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians, he was dealing with these same attitudes. Instead of understanding the call to suffer well as a follower of Jesus, the Corinthian church was buying the lie that suffering is a sign that God is not really with you. That suffering was for those rejected by God, not serving Him. You know, the Corinthians wanted their apostles to be strong, both in appearance and in attitude. They, they wanted them to be articulate, skilled in speech and rhetoric. Shoot, they even wanted them to charge a premium for possessing these traits. What they most definitely did not want was a so-called apostle who was weak and plagued by affliction and suffering. And yet that's exactly what they had in Paul. We've seen it for two weeks. An apostle by the will of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was not just any apostle. He was their apostle. And he means for them to understand and embrace that fact. Again, we've been saying Paul's defense of this apostleship is a major theme of this letter. We might expect him to point out all the ways that God has used him, not only in their lives but in the lives of so many other churches. But we, we might expect him to launch into his stellar resume of awards and accolades. That would probably be what we might do if someone was attacking us and our credibility. But that's not what Paul does here. He wastes zero time highlighting one particular aspect of his recent experiences, his incredible suffering. And in that suffering, his incredible weakness. I'm not sure if that's the strategy that I would naturally employ when being personally attacked. You think I'm weak? You don't know the half of it. Let me tell you just how weak I really am. And so that's what he does. First part of verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction that happened to us in the province of Asia. We don't want you to be unaware, uninformed. Paul uses this expression or a closely related variant of it six times in his letters. Twice in Romans, twice in 1 Corinthians, once in his letter to the Thessalonian church, and then right here. He wants his readers to be, quote, in the know on certain matters. And so this is his way of stressing. You might have some information. You, you might think you know the whole story, but you don't have all the information. So I want you to be fully informed. He calls them brothers, or brothers and sisters, reminding them, hey, we're not enemies here. We're family. We may have had our troubles, our, our relationship may be under strain, but we're family. You're still my brothers and sisters, and as such, I want you to know the whole truth of this situation. Specifically, he wants them to be fully informed about his 
recent suffering, the affliction that has happened to him and his companions. Paul uses the exact same word here that he did in last week's text, where he described the suffering that is met with the comfort of God. But now he's going to give a specific example of that sort of suffering. It's interesting that he doesn't give all the details that happened except the location. He says, suffering happened when they were in the province of Asia. It's almost certain that this occurred after the writing of 1 Corinthians. When we couple that with the fact that Paul was staying in Ephesus, the most important city in the province of Asia, he, he stayed there for a couple of years before moving on to Macedonia. When we take that information, we marry those details, I think it's safe to estimate that whatever this suffering was happened in Ephesus. Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians that he, in, he intended to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, and he adds this point, there are many opponents. There's a door open, and there are many opponents. Many oppose me. We're introduced to some of those opponents in Acts 19. If, if you remember that story, the city is thrown into an uproar. You have Demetrius the silversmith, and him and the other craftsmen are ticked off because there's all these people turning from idolatry and turning to the one true God. And guess what? Sales for the statue of Diana are on decline. And money talks, folks. Money drives behavior, right? And so they're mad, and this riot ensues. And Paul's life is in imminent danger until the clerk is able to step in and calm everyone down. Now, I can't say with certainty that that's the exact situation. It's unclear. But it's, it's interesting to me that his emphasis is not so much on precisely what happened, but rather on the severity of it, the profound effect that it had on him and his companions. Listen to what he continues to say. That we were burdened excessively, beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of living. Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had been passed against us. That's a pretty vivid language, is it not? We were burdened excessively. That is to say, we were weighed down, almost to the point of being crushed by this trial. It was beyond our strength. You could translate that simply as being beyond power. Not just their own power, but any power at their disposal. There was no human power or ability that could deliver them from the devastating situation they were in. And so what's the result? Well, they despaired even of living. The word for despair carries the idea of no exit, no way out. As Paul surveyed the crushing trial they were in and realized there was no innate power to deliver them, comes to the conclusion there's no way out. This was going to be the end. And so he concludes that they're on death row, as it were. I think the way it's originally written is better translated that they have the sentence of death. This is much more than a feeling from Paul. This is an acknowledgement of reality. He has come to realize that his suffering for and service to Christ is going to lead to his death. And apparently at the time, he thought it was going to be as a result of this particular trial. Friends, this is some serious suffering. This isn't a blip in their plans, a hiccup. This is a rock you to your core kind of suffering. And I wonder, can you relate to Paul here? Have you ever encountered a trial that was so severe, suffering so intense that you thought you might be utterly crushed by it? Where you came to the realization, I can't carry this on my own. I have no power in myself or anyone else to deal with this. Where the suffering was so intense you thought you might give up and give in under the weight of it. Well, so you're in good company. You're not abnormal in your suffering. You're also not alone in your suffering. Maybe that's you even right here this morning. Maybe you find yourself fighting for your figurative life, so to speak. The question is, what will you do with that suffering? Will you curl up tight in bed, pulling the blankets over your head, and pray for the morning to come? Burying your head in the sand, so to speak? Or will you acknowledge the presence of suffering in your life? Will you face it head on, even though you know that within yourself you do not have the power to deal with it? Even though on your own there seems to be no way out. 
Will you be transparent with your family about your suffering? Allowing yourself to be vulnerable, even if it makes you look weak. Paul didn't shy away from sharing with the Corinthian church just how serious and severe this suffering was. He, he didn't pretend like it wasn't happening or didn't happen. He didn't try to put on a brave face of rugged individualism. He was raw and real. He wanted to be sure that they were fully informed. Why? Well, for one, he was sharing his heart with them. But his recollection doesn't end with his inability to do anything about the suffering. No, he wanted them to understand there is a purpose for all of this. We need to understand the same thing, friends. The next thing I want you to see this morning is a purpose for suffering. purpose for suffering. When you think of all the questions that a child asks as they grow and develop, what do you think is the most commonly asked question by a child? Why? Louder? Why? Why? I asked my wife last I'd already written everything. Yeah, why? That three-letter question. Why? Pick up your toys from the table. Why? Because we're going to have dinner soon. Why? Because it's almost time for dinner. Why? Because this is the time that we eat dinner. Why? Because it's far enough from lunch and not close enough to dinner or to bedtime. Why? And on and on it goes. Sometimes it's comical and sometimes it's absolutely maddening. <laughs> but do we ever really grow out of that question? Why? This truth is perhaps most clearly displayed when we face trials and suffering. What do we tend to do almost right away? Why? Why is this happening? Why, God? Why me? Why now? Think about Job and the terrible suffering he endured. Losing his children, his possessions, his health even. And all he really wanted to know was why. Now, of course, his friends thought they were the experts. It's obviously because you're a filthy sinner, Job. Just repent and get over with. Or consider his wife. Who cares? Just curse God and die. Be done with it. But Job desperately wanted to know, why? Why me? Why now? What, what's really going on here? And you know what's always fascinating me about Job's story? He never gets his question answered. We get the peek behind the cosmic curtain. We get to see what's going on. But Job doesn't. His big question never gets answered. But what does he get? A better understanding of who he is and who God is. It's towards the end of Job, 42, 5, and 6. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job received a revelation of who God was, and that informed him of who he really was in comparison, and that was enough for him. Friends, we have to be prepared. Sometimes we will never have our specific why questions answered. In fact, I would say it's rare that we get the specific answers in this lifetime. But what we can expect from trial and suffering is that if we respond correctly, we will know God in a more intimate way, and we will understand ourselves better in relationship to Him. Every ounce of suffering has a purpose in the mind of God for the good of His children. He doesn't waste any of it. So why should we? I titled this point, A Purpose for Suffering, because what Paul goes on to reveal is not exhaustive. There are, there are many purposes in the vast wisdom of God, but here we have a universal one. Simply put, trials, affliction, suffering, they force us to choose who will you trust? Self, others, or the God of the universe? When we submit and learn to trust God in suffering, that trust will only grow deeper and stronger, which is exactly what happened to Paul and his companions. Remember, they're nearly crushed. There is no way out. There's no power to deliver them. This is it. It's the end of the line. Why? So that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So that we would not trust 
in ourselves, so that we would not have confidence in ourselves. Boy, doesn't that run counter to every single thing you hear today? What are we told over and over and over again? You need to trust yourself. Have more self-confidence. Just listen to your heart. You know what is best for you. Friends, our problem is not that we do not have enough self-confidence, but we trust ourselves too much. What's our natural response to difficulties, to affliction and adversity? I will find a way to deal with this. I will find an answer. I just need time to figure it out. I don't need help. I don't want to seem weak. I need to show how strong I am. I need to show that I have it all together. That line of thinking is simply not going to cut it. Paul says, we were brought to a point where death was imminent, where we had no chance of survival. Why? So that we would stop having self-confidence and start having God confidence. So we would stop trusting in our ability and trust in God's ability. And look what an incredible ability it is. This is, this is not any generic God. This is the God of all comfort. The God who imparts strength. The God who encourages. Not some impotent false God. This is the God who can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. This is the God who raises the dead. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Paul said they were burdened excessively, beyond strength, beyond any power they could summon on their own. But God. But the God who raises the dead has power that is beyond human imagination, understanding, or comprehension. He is the one to be trusted because He is the one who alone can deliver. Friends, why are we so quick to trust ourselves and so slow to trust the God who raises the dead? Why are we so prone to be confident in ourselves when we are so weak and so fragile? Each and every one of us will reach a point where we are totally impotent, utterly powerless to do anything about our situation. So the question is, where will you turn then? You know, that's not a problem that God will ever face. He's never been boxed in, never wondered where the exit path was, never felt helpless or powerless. He wields power even over death. The power most clearly demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In so doing, he defeated death and the one who holds the power over it once and for all. I know it's been a while since we were in our Hebrew study, but remember this precious truth. You heard just a couple verses later last week, when we back up in chapter 2 of Hebrews. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Listen, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death. That is the devil. And deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Through death, Jesus destroyed the devil. He delivered all those who were enslaved to the fear of death. Ha, ha! By going into death, through death, and coming out of death, totally victorious. Jesus utterly destroyed the power of death. And so again, why would we trust ourselves and not the God who raises the dead? But we know that we don't naturally think that way. We, we don't naturally trust in God instead of ourselves. And so, we need to be taught that. And I don't know of a teacher that's more effective than suffering, than affliction, than trials. Each one of us has certain things that you can only learn through the school of suffering, and God is faithful to teach you. One of those is the need to trust in Him, the God who raises the dead. Look what Paul says, first part of 10. He delivered us from so great a risk of death, and He will deliver us. You see why it was so important to Paul that they understand the severity of his trial in Asia? Because it's not at all about how weak or how strong Paul is. He knows he's weak. He knows he was powerless to do anything to escape his death sentence. God was not powerless. 
It was not ultimately about Paul at all. It is all about God. The God who raises the dead, the God who is powerful beyond measure, the God who delivers from death. See it clearly. When they stopped trusting in themselves and instead trusted in God, he did what only he could do. He delivered them. Let's say it how Paul's going to say it in chapter 12. His power was made manifest in their weakness. And so it remains today. Friends, if you're in a trial, if you're suffering, do you want to know why you're in that trial? Why you're suffering? I might not be able to give you the full gamut of reasons specific to your situation, but I can tell you with confidence that God wants to teach you to stop trusting yourself and instead trust Him. And then keep trusting Him. And don't stop trusting Him. <coughs> Even if it takes longer than you might like. Even if it seems like death is lingering right around the corner. Don't trust yourself in your ability. Trust the God who raises the dead. Because even if your suffering does result in physical death, with the God who raises the dead, you have nothing to fear from death. It has been defeated. Its sting is no more. There's purpose in your pain, in your suffering. Don't waste it. Learn from it. Trust God more in it and through it. The last thing I want you to see this morning are some of the prophets of suffering. The prophets of suffering. Again, we've noted it time and again, suffering is a non-negotiable aspect of the Christian life. You, you simply cannot choose whether or not you're going to suffer. If you're going to live for Christ, you will. Period. But we can choose how we'll respond to that suffering. Will we ignore it like we heard earlier? Try to wait it out? For some of us, will we rail against it, raging against God in anger and in bitterness? Will we wallow in self-pity, wondering, has bad stuff happened to a good person like me? We can choose to waste our suffering. Or we can embrace the reality of the situation, the presence of our suffering and our own inability to do anything about it. We can stop trusting ourselves and instead trust the God who raises the dead. And as we do, we can experience the profit of suffering, the gain of suffering. There are many profits. In our final verse and a half, we see both personal and corporate gain that accompanies successful suffering. Second half of verse 10. We have set our hope on him that he will deliver us yet again. The first aspect, the personal prophet, is really a, a continuation of the purpose that we saw in the last point. Successful suffering involves a trust in God that continues to grow the more we suffer and the more we subsequently trust. You saw what Paul said, he has delivered us and he will deliver us. There's a confidence that grows in God as he continues to prove himself faithful in our suffering. Until you almost reach this point where it's sort of like, all right, bring it on. Not in an arrogant way, right? Not somehow believing that we can withstand anything on our own, but rather that with this great God on our side, there's nothing that he cannot deliver us from. Paul's statement that God will deliver them yet again is not presumptuous. He does not somehow pretend that there's no more danger that accompanies serving the Lord. He still bears the sentence of death within himself. It's just that he doesn't fear that sentence anymore. When he stopped trusting self and instead trusted the God who raises the dead, it took that fear of death away. So he can confidently say... He will deliver us. Even if it means that deliverance is through death. Paul was aware, well aware, that he would eventually give his life for the gospel and his service to Christ. By the time it came, he was ready for it. He told Timothy that in his final letter, 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul was ready to receive his crown of righteousness, to depart and be with the Lord, which in his mind was far better 
to receive that gain that is ultimately dying. But until that day came, he trusted that the Lord would continue to deliver for him for as long as he had work for him to do. Friends, that level of trust is only possible through the long <coughs> process of suffering and continuing to find God faithful in that suffering. It's like the much-loved hymn states, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, or and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace <coughs> to trust him more. Where does that grace to trust him more come from? The school of suffering. There's great personal profit to suffering when we allow it to teach us to rely on God in new and deeper ways. But I also said a few moments ago there's corporate gain to suffering. Look what Paul does here. He expresses his unwavering trust in the deliverance of God, the God who raises the dead, but then he offers this wonderful invitation as you also join in helping us by prayer. Paul makes his weaknesses known. He fills them in on the severity of suffering. First, so they'll know the amazing deliverance of God. But then also so that they might partner together by praying for them. He says, I know that God will continue to deliver us as you also join in. See that? It's an invitation to partner not only with Paul, but hear me now, more importantly, with God himself. Isn't that the incredible thing about prayer? God is sovereign and omnipotent. He will do whatever he wills, however he wills, and he will not be thwarted. And yet, in his immense wisdom and according to his sovereign will, he has chosen to work his plans through the prayers of his people. That is nothing short of astounding in my mind. Do you view prayer as a burden or a privilege? Let's take it a step further. Do you view intercessory prayer as a burden or as a privilege? God's not like one of those so-called gods conjured in the image and likeness of men. He doesn't need your prayers. He doesn't depend on your prayers. He graciously offers you the gift of bringing your prayers to Him. Of being a part of His plan to work His will. You say, what incredible prophet this is. And so Paul's confidence that the Lord will continue to deliver is tied in part to the faithfulness of the Corinthians to pray. Why? Because God works through prayer. He is a God who answers prayer. And as he does, we see yet another prophet, another game. <coughs> Excuse me. So that many people may give thanks to God on our behalf for the gracious gift given to us through the help of many. Paul anticipates God answering their prayers, and as a result, many people will give thanks to God on their behalf. Let's say it another way. God will be glorified and the church will be edified. It's sort of interesting here because in most of Paul's letters in, in the beginning, he, he almost always starts out with some sort of prayer of thanksgiving for the people he's writing to. Galatians is really the only letter where he just gets right down to it and he says, come on now, lads, let's go. But here, he kind of flips the script. Do you see what he does? Instead of giving thanks to, for them, he says, here's how weak I am. I'd like you to give thanks for me now. But, but really not for me at all. Rather, for the incredible deliverance that God has worked and will continue to work through the prayers of his people. Isn't that the, the same thing true for us today? When one of us suffers and brings that suffering to the body, ask them to pray. I so appreciate that. Ken and I didn't coordinate. If you heard that, Ken talked about bringing that struggle to somebody here to seek prayer for it, right? Right? When we do that, we're open about the struggle, the trial, the weakness. When the body prays and sees the Lord at work as only he can, what happens? Boy, what joy, what celebration, what encouragement to our own faith and our walk 
when we see the fruit of our prayers. Friends, don't miss the profit, the gain that comes from praying for each other and then watching God work through those prayers to fulfill His sovereign will. Your faith will be strengthened. Your trust will grow. You will be better equipped to handle the suffering in your own life. And ultimately, God will be glorified. Which I hope you know is the only reason you still breathe. The reason you exist is the glory of God. But you say, Pastor, what happens when the prayer isn't answered in the way that I thought it should be? Or when I thought it should be? That's when we need to remember who we are and who God is. Sometimes the answer to our prayers is no. Or not like that. Or not yet. And that's where we must choose to trust the God who raises the dead. If he says no, or not yet, or not like that, you can be sure it is somehow infinitely better than the way that you would have chosen to do things. Even if it makes no sense in the moment. A surefire way to waste your suffering is to fall away when God doesn't meet your expectations. But a surefire way to make the most of it, to receive maximum profit from it, is to keep trusting even when things go the total opposite way from how you would prefer them to, from how you would have planned them to. No pain, no gain. Suffering is going to come, friends. What will you do when it comes? I urge you to make the most of it. Let your suffering be the success that the Lord intends for it to be. And so as a result of God's word, what are our next steps? First is to be transparent about my suffering. Don't ignore it. Don't put up a, a facade of strength. But don't wallow in it either. Acknowledge the presence of it, but then trust God, not myself. Realize that you have no power in yourself to overcome trials and suffering. He does. And friend, I don't know the status of each of your souls this morning, but if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it starts here, trusting God and not yourself. If you're trusting in anything but Jesus Christ on the day of judgment, you're going to come up short. Lord, here are all my accolades. Here's all the stuff I did for you. Get away from me. I never knew you. Only he that does the will of my Father. What's the will of the Father? Stop trusting yourself and trust the God who raises the dead. Friends, as the God who raises the dead, if you're in trial and suffering, and if you're not right now, it's coming. It's around the corner. If he could raise the dead, and he did, and he does, is there anything too hard for him? Is there anything he can't bring you through? Finally, I encourage you to, to partner in prayer. Prayer is a gift and a privilege. Make no mistake, God will work as He sees fit. He will accomplish what He wishes. But how incredible to be invited to partner with Him through prayer. The question is, will you? Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word and Your truth. Thank You for the encouragement that is in it. Thank You for the, the testimony of the Apostle Paul speaks to us so personally. Lord, I know that if there are those in here who have not felt that crushing weight of suffering, someday they will. We all reach a point where we just know there's nothing I can do about this. I pray that we would be good students in the school of suffering. Not trusting in ourselves, but in you, the God who raises the dead. Give courage to those who are suffering to reach out and say, hey, I'm suffering and I can't do anything about it. And may they be encouraged by the body to trust you, the God who raises the dead. May we partner with one another and more gloriously with you in prayer for one another, knowing that you will work your sovereign will for our good and your glory. Thank you for your word. Truth that sanctifies. May we... Take it, receive it, apply it, and bear much fruit from it. I pray in Jesus' name.